Now you talk about terror. What about for me? I've been terrorized all my day. Hammer all my day. Trucks circling the campuses of Columbia University and Harvard University publicly list the names and show the faces of students who signed a letter calling on the university to cut ties with Israel. These trucks are now being parked in front of students' homes. Another truck is at the University of Pennsylvania calling on the university president, Liz McGill, to resign following complaints the university fostered anti-Semitism by allowing for a pro-Palestinian festival in September. Major donors to these universities, including the billionaire Mark Rowan, the chief of the private equity giant Apollo Global Management, who donated $50 million to the University of Pennsylvania's business school, have announced they will withhold donations and demand the resignation of university presidents at the University of Pennsylvania and at Harvard. The prominent law firm, Davis Polk, rescinded three job offers it had made to students suspected of signing the Harvard Statement and a similar statement at Columbia University. This public harassment is only a tiny illustration of the widespread campaign to silence anyone who decries the siege of Gaza and calls for a ceasefire. Hundreds of social media accounts say the world's largest social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, X, YouTube, TikTok, are censoring accounts or actively reducing the reach of pro-Palestinian content a practice known as shadow banning. Authors, activists, journalists, and filmmakers contend that hashtags like Free Palestine and I Stand with Palestine, as well as messages expressing support for civilians uh, killed by Israeli forces, are being hidden by the media platforms. Major conferences on the Middle East have been forced to cancel. The Orthodox Jewish Chamber of Commerce, for example, successfully pressured Hilton Hotels into canceling the U.S. Campaign for Palestinian Rights event in Houston, at which the Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib was to have been the main speaker, calling it, quote, a conference for Hamas supporters, end quote, and, quote, Jew haters, end quote. The chamber is also campaigning to force Starbucks to close stores and dismiss thousands of workers, quote, unquote, who support Hamas, end quote, after their union posted a statement on X saying solidarity with Palestine. It has even launched a boycott of the coffee chain under the slogan, Drinking a Cup of Starbucks is Drinking a Cup of Jewish Blood. The Council on American-Islamic Relations was forced to cancel its annual banquet in Arlington, Virginia, after receiving bomb threats. The rare Palestinian voices that do get through the media blockade, such as Nora Arakat, a Palestinian-American human rights lawyer who appeared live on CBS and ABC, are often then erased. Erikot saw the segments in which she spoke removed from the playbacks of the shows online. The Frankfurt Book Fair was accused of, quote-unquote, shutting down Palestinian voices after an award ceremony to honor a novel by the Palestinian writer Adnia Shibli was canceled. Meanwhile, official Israeli spokespeople and politicians, as well as their supporters, uh, are given ample airtime to accuse anyone who objects to Israel's slaughter of Palestinians in Gaza as being apologists or spokespeople for terrorists. Joining me to discuss this censorship is Dylan Saba, a staff attorney with Palestine Legal. He was commissioned by an editor at the Guardian newspaper to write about the campaign to silence voices critical of Israel's assault, but was then informed shortly before the piece was to be published that the newspaper would not run it. So let's begin with this level of censorship, uh, which is probably unprecedented since maybe immediately after the events of 9-11, and I was one of them attempting to uh, denounce the calls to invade Iraq. Um, but let's lay out its, its intensity, its reach, and then let's go into perhaps the causes of it. Thanks, Chris. And thanks so much for having me on and, and raising and elevating this important issue. Um, as you said, this is a level of suppression that is uh, completely unprecedented um, in, in the modern history of the, of the Palestine Solidarity Movement. 
So I work for Palestine Legal. Um, we're a legal nonprofit representing folks who speak out Palestinian rights. Um, and we were founded in 2014, and we've never seen anything remotely like this. We've had hundreds of requests for legal assistance over the past several several weeks, um, completely eclipsing the total number of, in, uh, of intake requests we've had for the entirety of, of all of last year. So it's an, it's an exponential surge. Um, it's reaching uh, students, employees, professors, uh, folks in all different industries. We've seen a wave of retaliatory firings for posts made uh, on private social media accounts supporting Palestinian rights. We've seen student groups surveilled, suppressed um, from levels ranging from the federal government to state government to individual campus administrations. We've seen professors had classes canceled, being locked out of emails. Um, uh, the, 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 the range of political expression that is being targeted is wide, um, you know, from, from very banal calls to a ceasefire um, to more radical statements, um, and it is widespread. Um, I think it's important to note a couple of things. Um, one is that this is a response to a massive upsurge in pro-Palestine support in the United States, that the, the movement has made major gains, the Palestine Solidarity Movement has made major gains, and more and more you have folks who are willing to speak out for Palestinian freedom. Now, of course, this is met with suppression, um, that this growing movement is a threat to the Israel lobby, it's a threat to Israel advocacy organizations, um, and folks who have uh, the interests of the U.S. government and U.S. imperial interests um, in, you know, uh, who share those interests as well. Um, I think that the comparison to the post 9-11 era, although was a, I was a, a child at then, is probably apt, um, and we have been describing this as uh, a McCarthyite level of suppression. Uh, but I do want to raise a, a key distinction here. Um, this is now happening in the era of social media, and that has particular concerns and implications for regular individuals who, who may not be uh, famous or, or notable names. And, and that's the introduction of doxing as a, as a particularly heinous tactic. Um, and you, you mentioned this with, with reference to the trucks on campuses. What we're seeing is college students, um, individuals who are, are speaking out, um, or even you know for a, an action as benign as removing a poster are being filmed. Uh, that footage is being sent then to major media outlets such as Fox News. And you have folks on the internet who are, you know, digging into it, finding out who these students are, publicizing their names, releasing their names, and then those individuals are being hit with a torrent of discriminatory comments, um, threatening texts, emails, phone calls, death threats, heinous remarks, and are basically being bullied into silence. Um, and this is a, a widespread tactic that we're seeing, and it, you know, has the the uh, the negative consequence of, of, of chilling speech. Folks are scared to speak out because they, they worry that they're going to be smeared, um, that they're going to lose a, uh, their job or a future employment activity, uh, a, a future employment offer. Um, and um, and, and, um, and the, the doxing tactic is um, something that the Israel groups have been using for a while. So um, folks are probably fami uh, familiar with Canary Mission, StopAntisemitism.org, which are some online blacklists that have really honed in on this tactic of of smear online smears and doxing, but we are seeing it at an unprecedented level right now. Well, as you know, this isn't new. Uh, it's just uh, exponentially exploded because there's been long, um, uh, years long assaults against the BDS movement, especially at universities, uh, banning. I spoke at Northeastern right after they had banned Students for Justice in Palestine. Um, and, uh, uh, and so it's building and of course that has used the power of donors, uh, in the past. Um, so th th there was already a kind of foundational system in place. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the, 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 like you said, the tactics are not, are not new. And, um, in general, I think that this tactic of suppression and silencing has been the major move of Israel advocacy groups in the past 10 or 15 years, in part because folks realize, that, you know, pro-Israel folks realize they can't really win the argument on substance, right? So the fact that these debates are happening um, in workplaces on college campuses is really bad news when Israel has, you know, has its most right-wing fascist government that it's ever had um, and has really only had right-wing governments for recent memory. 
Um, so, and meanwhile, dispossession of Palestinian land continues unabated. You have settlement expansion, regular assaults on, on Gaza, and, and really um, no political hope um, you know, for, for progress on any kind of, you know, negotiation front. Um, so there's not really much in the way that you can say to justify the Israeli regime and, and what they're doing. And so the tactic has basically been, okay, then we need to suppress this criticism, um, lest it start to have an effect on, on, on U.S. government policy. What do we know about those who are behind these groups? Oftentimes on campuses, they will use Hillel houses, uh, as kind of outposts of APAC, but to, to what can you uh, tell us about the structure, how it works? Well, we do know that there are some major organizations um, that have as their, you know, function the suppression of this kind of grassroots organizing. So this is organizations like the ADL and the Brandeis Center um, that purport to um, fight against anti-Semitism, but in large part, what that means to them is suppressing pro-Palestine speech, which has the effect of clouding the definition of what anti-Semitism is in a way that's very harmful for Jewish students um, and also targets Jewish students um, because Jewish students, you know, make up a large part of the Palestine solidarity movement in the U.S. Um, and, you know, especially like, as you mentioned, the, the role of Hillel, which is, you know, an organization that has an explicitly pro-Israel policy and yet purports to be a home for all Jewish students on college campuses. Um, makes it such that anti-Zionist Jews don't have a, a religious home that supports them um, on campuses and, and are, you know, are being targeted along with Arab and Muslim and Palestinian students um, for their organizing. Likewise, you also have, you know, some, some um, extremely racist elements of, of this suppression and of, of various forms of surveillance, surveillance um, you know, that emerge kind of, of the, from the post 9-11 uh, legal paradigm and 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 um, and security state infrastructure, where you have um, student groups surveilled, activists surveilled, um, and um, and this is particularly harmful for for um, Palestinian Arab and Muslim students. Well, the documentary "The Lobby," which never aired in the United States, Electronic Intifada put up a pirated copy, but they sent a, a student undercover into these uh, Jewish, American, Jewish, Zionist, pro-Israel groups. And one of the things that came out was how they would essentially recruit students to spy on other students. Yeah, that's, I mean, we've, we've seen that, um, you know, spying, infiltration, surveillance, these are all threats um, to Palestine organizing um, on, on campus. Absolutely. Let's talk about the media. Um, there's really only one voice virtually uh, in, that's heard about this conflict. Uh, but w this, of course, control of information, this censorship has extended to, to mainstream media platforms. Yeah, absolutely. So a lot of what we're seeing in terms of employment retaliation is in the media. So you have editors at magazines being fired um, for, you know, merely uh, uh, amplifying calls for a ceasefire. Oh, this was, um, this art, was this art forum? Was that's right. That's right. You have, um, as you mentioned, Palestinians going on um, major news and not having their segments aired. And, and you mentioned Nora, but there are other examples as well. Basically, any Palestinian who goes on to the news and does anything other than lament the dead in Gaza, anyone who's offering uh, necessary political context for understanding what's happening is being is being censored, censored in silence. And this is a process of the media manufacturing consent for what the United States is supporting in Gaza. And that, and that is intentionally about removing context. And it's also about refocusing the, the worries of Americans um, onto these panics about what college students are doing and, and saying. It's, ex it's extremely dangerous um, that you, know, you have these horrific atrocities uh, being uh, committed by Israel with the full backing and support of the United States and Gaza, what many have called a genocide, including the preeminent ge genocide scholars, um, and 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 that's a very dangerous that's a very dangerous message um, for for folks who are supportive of of Israeli policies of Israeli apartheid and 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 what's happening right now, and that dissent is very is very dangerous. So it so the, the censorship is key. The refocusing uh, or attempted refocus of the American attention 
on, um, you know, on the, the concerns around uh, what, what college students are, uh, are saying are, are all attempts, basically, um, to, to stifle out political dissent in, you know, one of the most key moments for political dissent in the country's history. They've done a very effective job of controlling the language. So uh, I think it's uh, not deniable that the firing of rockets by Hamas is a war crime, indiscriminate, or certainly what the killing of civilians at the rave is a war crime. Uh, but while they're very quick to denounce Hamas for war crimes, they will not up employ the same standards towards Israel, which has carried out egregious war crimes for decades. We can go all the way back to the ethnic cleansing in 1948 and the 50 villages where there were massacres, right up to what they're doing today in the West Bank. But talk about that difference in terms of standards and in terms of language, because there's it's a black and white issue. Israel is in clear violation of international law, not only in terms of what it's doing to the people in Gaza, but in, in terms of the occupation itself. No, you're touching on a key point. And what that um, differentiation rests on is racism. It is precisely anti-Palestinian racism that allows people to say that there is no distinction between Palestinians in living in Gaza and, and Hamas, which is exactly the messaging of the Israeli government. Um, they're saying it openly. They're saying that they're not um, treating them differently. And they're saying that, that Gaza is full of terrorists, right? That, that distinction is, is based on racist assumptions about Palestinians. It's based on the ability to paint Muslims and Arabs and Palestinians with a, with a, with a broad brush that is to paint them as a threat to Israeli safety and, and Jewish safety. Um, so that, that is what, uh, is, is behind, um, the, the smears. Um, and that is what allows uh, the kind of naked genocidal rhetoric on the Israeli side and on the on the uh, the U.S. side in supporting these actions. That's what's able, uh, or that's what uh, allows that rhetoric to be um, perpetuated. And the frankly BS uh, statements from Israel that they are respecting international law or that they hold themselves to international law when it's evident. You just have to look at the images coming out of Gaza. They are obliterating civilian infrastructure. That is clearly a war crime. You can look at the, the the casualty counts that no one is disputing, although there was some indication that Biden was casting doubt on them, although I think he's walked that back. Um, you know, thousands of children uh, being being killed. The number of civilian casualties is, is uh, uh, insanely high. Um, there's no way that it meets the disproportionate disproportionality standard um, of international law. And that's not even to mention um, the collective punishment actions of cutting off electricity um, and and water. Um, so if you have naked violations of international law that are being blatantly ignored um, by by the media, and then you have uh, complicity in um, in in conflating the Palestinian, the, you know, the the, the Palestinian citizens um, of or the the Palestinians living in Gaza, um, you know, of whom half are are children, um, and the actions of Hamas. To what do you attribute this? cowardice on both within the media and the political class? Is it just expediency, careerism? What, what, what do you think is driving it? Because it, it's very hard to walk away from those images and not understand what's going on. I think that there are, is, um, I think that it is, I think that there, people are worried about their jobs. I think, I think that we've, you know, we at Palestine Legal have seen, um, you know, over a hundred uh, threats to employment that, and that's just what has come into us you know, dozens of people who have already been fired. Um, and we've seen this trend in the media as well. I think that folks are um, intimidated because there are higher up people at a lot of these establishment media institutions who frankly are Zionist and do support the actions of Israel and are very freaked out that you have a growing chorus of people in the United States who are rightly identifying this, what Israel is doing as genocide. Um, and, you know, in moments of crisis like this, we are put on the back foot in terms of, you know, put in a defensive posture because there's this massive wave of racism and retaliatory backlash. But we're also seeing major discursive jumps. We're seeing people come out in support of Palestinian rights 
um, in numbers that we've never seen before, hundreds of thousands of people taking the streets, um, not just in the United States, across the world. I mean, people talking about um, what's happening to the Palestinians, what Israel is doing in, in new terms. Um, and and that, has, that has represented a, a major leap a major leap in people's thinking about this. Um, the images are, are horrific and shocking, and that's really moving people. And I think that poses a real threat to people who are invested in the continuation of United States support for Israel and in, in Israel's uh, genocidal and expansionist policy, uh, politics and policies. One of the tactics they have employed, especially against BDS activists, is to criminalize within the legal code uh, people who speak about Palestinian human rights. Can you talk about that as a tool? Absolutely. So this is part of the legal infrastructure that came out um, of the, the, the post 9-11 world um, and, and even before. And, and these are a set of really broad. Well, so there's two things. There is there is the um, laws passed against BDS, but also what we're seeing is a, a use of um, or a reference to laws about material support for terrorism. Um, and these are extremely broad and vague laws um, that have been used to stifle political dissent um, and, you know, and criminalized, you know, aid, sending aid to Gaza um, and other forms um, of, of advocacy. Now, well, that was how laws, that's how they arrested the Holy Land Foundation, that, which exactly is a, right. it was a charity. Exactly right. And we, we you know, just last week, uh, DeSantis, Governor DeSantis in Florida, issued a directive to the University of Florida system to deactivate uh, SJPs, that's the student, student Palestine student groups um, in the University of Florida system uh, with reference to these laws. Now, it's a ridiculous accusation. It's a blatant violation of the First Amendment. It will absolutely be challenged in court. Um, but it's an example of the, 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 the kinds of suppressive efforts um, taken at the state level. Now, it's not just the state level. You have also a, a, a resolution that was passed um, unanimously, I believe, in the Senate that condemns student organizing and, and basically equates them with Hamas. This is an incredibly, incredibly dangerous threat to our civil, civil liberties in this country. It's an incredibly dangerous threat to the rights of folks to engage in political organizing and, uh, and political dissent. Also, you know, as, as you, you made reference to, there have been organized attempts to criminalize um, the, the uh, or, or to make illegal um, the boycott, divestments, and sanctions movement. There are anti-BDS statutes in uh, the majority of states at this point, um, trying to delegitimize um, nonviolent organizing in support of Palestinian liberation. You come from, uh, you are Palestinian Jewish descent. Um, uh, I think one of the things that I've always found interesting is, and I, you made reference to this, is that when I do meet with students for justice in Palestine groups on universities, a significant percentage of those students are Jewish. Can you talk about your generation uh, of uh, people who come out of the Jewish community? Because I don't think that they are standing uh, behind Israel. And then I want you to talk about the importance of the Christian right, because uh, I don't think I think the Christian right is a factor in this because it is also a political force uh, that stands with the far right in Israel. Yeah, absolutely. So as you you know as you made reference to, um, I'm I'm both Jewish and, and Palestinian, and I've been an organizer now and uh, on on this issue for about ten years ago. Ten years. Ten years ago, I was uh, I was a college student and. Um, the the younger Jewish community in the United States is is far more open to Palestinian liberation, is far more active on this issue than the generations prior, and it's posed a real generational divide within the Jewish community. Um, but it's but it's also inspired a lot of hope that we can actually build a uh, a, a pluralistic uh, justice movement um, on this issue, and that poses a threat. Um, that poses a threat. Um, to um, you know, to pro-Israel groups, to the older generation who counts on that support um, from the Jewish community to justify Israel's crimes, and they're losing that support, and the data indicates that they're losing that support, um, and that's a growing trend. Um, and it's beautiful to see. When I was an SJP as a student, it was an incredible diverse group of students. Um, you know, 
Jewish students, yes. Palestinian students, yes. Muslim students, also other students. Um, and increasingly, what we've seen in the past 10 years is that students from other affinity groups, Black students, Asian students, um, students part of other justice struggles are recognizing the connection with the Palestinian liberation struggle. Um, and we're seeing um, you know, a, a wide range of, of anti-racist groups stand in solidarity with the Palestinians. And that too is a threat. Um, that too is a threat um, to, to um, folks who are, are wary of growing consciousness around racial justice um, and are, are wary of the Palestinian struggle, including in, in being included in that message um, for you know, the threat that that poses to their, to their narrative. You're also right to point to, um, to, to the Christian right as a key player here. Um, you know, people don't necessarily realize this, but most Zionists in the United States are not Jewish. They're Christian. Christian Zionism is a, is a, um, you know, is, is a, a, a huge movement. People, um, people support Israel for, you know, their own kind of religious uh, reasons, but also because of its, you know, affinity within with right-wing project more broadly. Um, and so that, you know, that is a key point when, you know, we are often put in a position where we have to articulate um, something that should be obvious, which is that anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism are totally separate. You know, anti-Semitism is, is hatred of someone for religious identity. Anti-Zionism is a principle, it's a principled political position um, that is, is not related to religion. Um, it's about opposing Israel's policies of genocide, of apartheid, of settler expansion. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, we are often uh, the major smear made against Palestine organizers and the justification for a lot of this suppression, um, a lot of this surveillance is, is anti-Semitism. And it's fundamentally cynical. It's fundamentally a misapplication of discrimination uh, principles um, and, and, and an excuse to, to, to stamp out political dissent um, in a way that's very dangerous, as I, as I mentioned before, because it is not in the interest of, of Jewish students, of Jewish people more broadly, to, uh, to, to confuse the meaning of what anti-Semitism is. Well, the other problem is that it essentially, by conflating the two, uh, it, it increases, I think, attacks of anti-Semitism because those attacks become confused with anti-Zionism. Yes, absolutely. So, you know, you, you have um, people making the argument, right, in a legal forum and, and elsewhere in the media that being Zionist is a fundamental component of Jewish identity. Now, as it, you know, as we're saying, we know that that's not true. We know that a growing uh, portion of the, you know, of of young Jews are anti-Zionist, are standing in solidarity with Palestinians. Um, we know that Zionism is core to a whole host of political ideologies and and beliefs that have nothing to do with the, with the Jewish religion. And yet, folks want to insist on that argument. Um, and and as you said, that has a lot of uh, nasty consequences down downstream. Where do you see this going? You do have a powerful grassroots movement, even in small towns. I live in Princeton. There were probably 500 people uh, out on the street on Monday uh, in solidarity with the Palestinians. Uh, and yet the political class is kind of calcified, uh, the media itself. Uh, but where, where do you see all this headed? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, as you said, the grassroots movement is uh, it's growing rapidly and it's the largest it's ever been. There's about to be a march on Washington on November 4th, organized by the Palestinian Youth Movement and others that uh, by all appearances is gonna be absolutely massive. Uh, and we're sending a message to policymakers in Washington, to university administrators, um, that this is a force that cannot be suppressed, um, that this dissent um, from what US, the United States is supporting is something that cannot be ignored. Um, and it, you know the, the, the people in Washington will have to take us seriously. Uh, if Joe Biden wants to win in 2024, he's going to need young people to come out for him. He's going to need people, voters in Michigan, which has a large uh, uh, Arab population, uh, to, to support him. And, uh, and more broadly, um, he needs to stick up for something, stand for something, right? You have people of conscience all over this country saying, you know, you are complicit in a genocide and demanding a ceasefire. Now, as of right now, um, that that call has not made that much traction in Congress for the reasons that you're saying. Um, I hope and expect that that will change. Uh, with each passing day, more and more people are becoming conscious of Israel's crimes, are seeing the images uh, coming out of Gaza, and are saying, "I don't stand for this. Not you know, not on my dime. 
not in my name. Great. That was Dylan Saba, a staff attorney with Palestine Legal. I want to thank the Real News Network and its production team, Cameron Granadino, Adam Coley, David Hebden, and Kayla Rivera. You can find me at chrisedges.substack.com. Thank you so much for watching The Real News Network, where we lift up the voices, stories, and struggles that you care about most. And we need your help to keep doing this work. So please, tap your screen now, subscribe, and donate to The Real News Network. Solidarity forever.